Hey, hey there, everybody. It is Dr. Josh here. It is such a treat to be here with you today at these times um, where we're also socially isolated. Here I am uh, at my home, my home office, doing much of my work uh, here from home. Um, we are live on YouTube together, and it's really nice to sort of have some semblance of togetherness here. Um, we're, right now, we're in that kind of slightly awkward moment where people are kind of filing into our live chat. So um, while we do that, let me um, ask you for a favor, a question, and then I'm going to give you a little fun kind of quiz um, related to the background here behind me. So first of all, can you chime in to the chat box, you should have a little spot on your browser where you can tell me that you can see and hear me. Um, that would be very helpful. And if you wanna just give me a thumbs up, that's great. If you also wanna tell me where you are, that would be lovely as well, so I can get a sense of who's here. Um, I see Steve, and that is great that you're there. You were the first one. Denise from St. Petersburg, Jerry, um, and uh, Jerry has a provocative question right out the gates, we'll get to that. Um, it looks like things are going well. So um, that chat box is the place for you to ask questions. I'm going to do the very best that I can to get to all of those questions. I'm going to give you a little bit of a presentation first. And as people are, um, are filing in uh, to our stream here, as we get started, it sometimes takes a couple minutes for people to get their uh, their tech squared away. Um, let's let's do this. You know, like I say, here I am at my home office, and and uh, in order to set up this stream and make it look pretty in the background, like I did, um, I brought a couple of plants from my from my plant room. I I uh, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I'm a plant nerd, and I have a plant room um, with grow lights and all that sort of stuff. So lots of plants here, and um, let's do a quick challenge while we're uh, while we're waiting. I'm gonna uh, I have a few back here. You can see the beautiful. Uh, bougainvillea there, which you, I'm in Connecticut, and you can bloom a bougainvillea plant in the wintertime in Connecticut. There's a living proof right there. Um, I'm going to pull out this one. Take a look at this, everybody. I'm going to hold this up to the camera for you, and this is going to be your quiz as we're, I'm glad, Dean, Alice, Emily, I'm so glad you all here. You can see and hear me. Um, while people are filing in, before we get to our content and your questions, here's the quiz that I have for you. Anybody know what this is? Take a look at those leaves. Sturdy little plant. I'll watch the chats and see if anybody uh, knows what that plant is. This is a tricky one, an unusual plant to be growing uh, in a home plant grow room. I'm gonna give you a hint right now and wet my whistle at the same time. That plant is called Camilla sinensis. Camilla sinensis is otherwise known as tea. Those are tea leaves. Now, that's not the tea that I'm drinking, although it's the very same plant. Um, that uh, is what a tea plant looks like. I'll give you another look, and then we'll get right into it. Um, Terry, good guess. Coffee, pretty close. Um, and that was a good hint. I had my cup of coffee earlier. This is uh, Camilla sinensis. This is a tea plant. Um, beautiful. Um, and the the leaves of this plant are what are used to make, whether it's green tea, black tea, white tea, all depends on the growing conditions, the processing and whatnot. Um, but that's Camilla sinensis, and I grow a plant there. Um, while we're at it, and as people are filing in, there's another one right next to it, this plant here, and that one is called patchouli. If I touch the leaves here, many of you, especially anybody who has hippie roots or natural medicine roots, Oh my gosh, I wish you could smell my fingers right now. Patchouli is like the hippie incense, right? Hippie perfume. Um, and that plant perfumes the air in this lovely uh, kind of organic sort of way. So that's a, a little introduction to a couple of the plants that I pulled out of my, my plant room today. So um, welcome, everybody. We are here. I'm Dr. Josh Levitt. I'm here um, on behalf of Up Wellness, a wonderful company that I'm so proud to be a part of and, a, and, a, and an amazing team behind it. Thank you all. Uh, you know who you are for helping make this a reality. There's a lot that goes into getting a life like this to work. Um, so here we are. And uh, there, you guys all saw um, some introductory material about the kinds of things that we were going to cover today, and we're going to get to that right now. Um, and then towards the end of this conversation, I would love to take your questions. So I'm going to start off with uh, some information, get your year off on a healthy, good footing, um, and then I want to take your questions. It's hard to navigate both of those things at once. So let me start off here, and we'll talk for 20, 30 minutes or so, feel free to chime in in the chat room as we go. Maybe I'll pepper in some quiz questions along the way. Um, and then be prepared to ask me your questions. This is really your opportunity to ask me anything, anything health related. I'll do my best to answer 
um, in uh, an appropriate um, in appropriate way, given the fact that here we are in an online venue. Yes, I am a doctor. Of course, no, I am not your doctor. Um, and so I'll do my best to kind of keep that boundary and answer your questions that you have about health, medicine, natural health, herbs, supplements, etc. So with that, let's uh, let's get right into it. The first um, the first bullet point in the uh, in the in the material that you saw about what we were going to talk about was about three foods to eliminate immediately. And, and, and this applies, of course, to losing weight this January. But we need to be careful that losing weight this January, you know, the pitfalls of the ever present annual New Year's resolution, which historically don't work, we want to kind of expand that focus. So yes, let's lose weight this January. But also, yes, let's make that weight loss and those health improvements sustainable for the longer term. Because yes, we, losing weight is a short term goal, but it leads to long term health benefits in the form of decreased risk of disease and death from all causes. So it's, it's remarkable to know that 80%, 80, 80% of premature deaths in this country can be prevented. 80%. That means that the power of a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle is just, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's like, I often think, what if a drug company could package, make a product that was 100% effective, that was 100% safe, had absolutely no side effects? I mean, that would be a blockbuster, right? So, you know, I've now charged my team, be advised, let's let's make that, right? Let's make that. That's going to be up well. This is next product, 100% effective, 100% safe. Uh, unfortunately, it's already exists. That product already exists. And that is a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle. And that's going to be the kind of the, the thread uh, that we're going to talk around here today. So, um, the three foods that I want you to eliminate now and into your future. The first one, anybody have any guesses about what the first food um, to that I'm going to suggest you eliminate is? Let me, let me give you a second or two. I'll take another sip of my tea and see if anybody gets this one right. The first food that I want you to eliminate immediately. What do you think it is? I'm following along in my chat, and I think there's a little bit of a, de a delay in the chat, which is fine. Um, I will uh, not keep the suspense up for too much longer. The first food that I want you all to eliminate is high fructose corn syrup. This is a highly processed corn-derived sweetener that is widely distributed in the diet. Valerie, you said sugar. Marianne said soy. We got a lot of sugars. We got some glutens. We got some sugars. I, now I get this, a sense of how the delay works. Um, all of you who said sugar are very much close to right, right? The, 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 uh, I'm being a little bit more specific than that, um, and I'm talking about high fructose corn syrup. Um, high fructose corn syrup is this highly processed sugar, uh, of course, derived from corn, and it finds its way into sweetened beverages. It's, it's generally speaking what sweetens most sodas and all those sweet sort of drinks. So I want you to avoid that completely. Now, a lot of people signed in uh, and, and mentioned uh, sugar as a thing to avoid. Now, of course, sugar is a is a is a an interesting component, right? It is unquestionably, you know, we're talking about glucose. When most of you are writing sugar, you're referring to sucrose, table sugar. But it turns out that glucose, which is what you're measuring when you get your blood test done, is the primary and preferred fuel for all of the cells of your body. You can't eliminate it entirely. In fact, most of the foods that you eat ultimately have a metabolic fate. They get broken down into sugar and sugar provides the universal fuel source to power the cells of your body. So eliminating it completely is really next to impossible if you can if you plan on living very much longer. What you guys are actually referring to is added sugars in the diet. And there, I would completely agree. So in our food processing system, and we're going to talk a lot more about it this afternoon, um, there are prodigious amounts of added sugars in the diet. If you just look back 100 years ago when people were eating minuscule amounts of sugar, you know, a, a sugar cube in your coffee was a delicious delight and a luxurious treat for the royals is now something that we're eating by the kilogram on a daily basis in many parts of the world, which is just shocking. And it's, it's a, it is, yes, a fundamental problem and a leading risk factor, dietary risk factor for obesity, for diabetes and insulin resistance, for many 
many cancers for all sorts of degenerative diseases. So yes, sugar, but more specifically, high fructose corn syrup is more concerning because it has even worse metabolic effects um, on your pancreas, on your insulin sensitization system than does sugar itself. So let's do away with the high fructose corn syrup this year and forever. Um, okay, now on to the next thing, the next of three foods to eliminate immediately and on into the future. Um, I won't uh, give you the quiz and deal with that that latency of the delay. Um, this one might surprise some of you because nobody, I don't think, said this so far in uh, as a guest for the first food. Um, this is maybe a little bit provocative and controversial, but what I'm going to suggest is number two is meat from conventionally raised animals. So let me rephrase that. I did not say meat full stop. What I said was meat from conventionally raised animals. And there is a big difference, right? So, you know, back in the day, again, in those times when a spoonful of sugar was a was a treat for the for the royals, um, animal protein, and I'm talking about all different sorts of animal protein, whether it be um, beef uh, from, from cows, whether it be any of the number of different meats from, from pigs uh, or from birds, turkeys, chickens, uh, eggs, dairy products, animal protein in general, and fish, it came from the wilds, right? Or at least ranches that were as close to wild as possible. And, and these days, what we've got is an entirely different situation. We've got a massive factory farming operation. I'm sure many of you um, live in places where, you know, a commute across your state would show you uh, the massive scale of the kinds of cattle and poultry operations that grow the meat for, uh, for the American food supply. And what I would like to suggest here is that we should eliminate those sources of animal protein from our diets. And that does not mean that you need to stop eating meat. That does not mean that you need to become vegetarian or vegan per se. What it means is you need to lever up the quality of the animal protein that you are eating. And there are several reasons for this in two main buckets, two main categories. The first is that it's better for you right? Um, the meat from wild animals, that's whether it's wild game or animals that are raised in a more regenerative or sustainable way. For example, uh, grass-fed beef or regeneratively raised beef that's coming from these kind of eco-friendly, uh, environmentally friendly, animal-friendly, farmer-friendly farms is much, much better because it contains a different fatty acid profile. Um, it does not contain a bunch of the kind of additives like antibiotics, and added hormones that are found in conventionally raised uh, animal products. So we want to minimize or eliminate entirely animal protein that's coming from large factory farms. Those things are not good for the animals. They're not good for the planet. They are not good for you. So my suggestion for you this year and beyond is to lever up the quality of the meats and the poultry and the eggs and the dairy that you eat. Uh, and generally speaking, what that's gonna mean is you're gonna ratchet down the volume. You're gonna decrease the amount of those foods that you eat, but you're gonna increase the quality and you're gonna get them from smaller farmers who are doing good by the cattle, doing good by the pigs, doing good by the chickens, uh, and, and and we'll talk about fish in a minute, um, and, and doing good by the planet uh, at the same time. So that's number two. We were gonna eliminate meats from conventionally raised animals. And I understand that for a lot of people, that's gonna mean that you're gonna be eating less meat. And yes, I am okay with that. Less in quantity, more in quality. Okay, now on to number three. Um, let's do it again. I'm going to take a sip of my of my tea and let's see if anybody has a guess about what number three food to eliminate immediately is. Um, and as I take a sip, I'll follow the, the, the chat here. It is delicious. Camilla sinensis. For those of you who joined on um, a little bit later, this plant right here is Camilla sinensis. That's uh, that's tea. Those are tea leaves. I did not use that plant to make my tea, but it is uh, it is the same thing. Um, so uh, as the chat is starting to fill up, I'm going to get into the answer to number three, the third food to eliminate immediately and into the future. Uh, and that is industrial seed 
oils. I have a feeling that that surprised people. I'm guessing that nobody was going to guess that I was going to say that. Uh, industrial seed oils. People are mentioning now the chats are coming in. Wheat, white flour, pasta, dairy, etc. All, all reasonable choices and all things that probably most people should cut down on. My third on this list is industrial seed oils. Um, let's talk about this for a minute. These are oils um, that are only just a recent addition to the human diet. Oils that are derived from plants like soybeans, corn, a plant called rapeseed, which is a terrible name for a plant, and that's the source of canola oil. Um, did you know that canola, canola oil comes from a plant called rapeseed? It's, it's awful. Um, cotton seed, safflower seeds, these are plants that are used to make these industrial seed oils. So a little bit of history here. I think you'll find this fascinating. Um, these plant oils were for a long time used to make soap. Um, they, they stand up well to the soap making process and two enterprising young men in the late 1800s, um, started using these seed oils and making, you know, soaps that people really love. Their names, uh, were William Proctor and James Gamble. And if that sounds at all familiar, uh, yeah, that's them, Proctor and Gamble. They were soap makers to start off with. Um, and they figured out something brilliant. And the thing that they figured out was that they could take cotton seeds which were a byproduct of the cotton industry, you know, these seeds basically a waste product. Um, and what they could then do is superheat the cotton seeds, which by the way is terrible for the integrity of the oils. Then they would extract them with the, the oils from the cotton seeds with a petroleum distillate, usually hexane, highly toxic. So you're superheating cotton seeds using a petroleum distillate to extract them, then uh, then deodorize this, this final product because it stinks, by the way. Um, and that deodorization process turns the oils in the cotton seed into what we now know as trans fats, terrible for your health, literally toxic and poisonous. And then add some colors and some flavors to this. And I'm going to spare you because there's a latency to our chat. But here's the quick question, and I'll give you one second to sort of think it through. Um, after they took the cotton seeds and superheated them, extracted them with petroleum distillates, deodorized them, added colors and flavors, do you know what they made? You know what that turned into? It was a revolution in the late 1800s. Uh, and until fairly recently, one of the most popular products on supermarket shelves. And it was Crisco. That's Crisco. And that was Procter & Gamble's claim to fame. And from there, they went on to create an empire of, uh, of, of home, uh, you know, home goods, food products, etc. Crisco was among the first. Um, that stuff is toxic. It always was. It still is. There was all kinds of political and legal and financial shenanigans going on that led this product to become so popular, um, suggesting that it was some kind of alternative to the natural oils that were used before, like olive oil, uh, even like butter uh, and lard and things that people use traditionally. Uh, and Crisco sort of set the stage for the widespread production of these industrial seed oils, which are now widely dispersed in the, in the, in the diet, met massive presence in processed foods, and they're a real problem. These things are omega-6 oils. Um, and omega-6 oils are really interesting. I'm not going to spend too much time on the technical details here because I do want to get to your questions. But omega-6 oils are essential. We have to have them. And you know there's this thing, that the common saying, it's, it says too much of a good thing. Well, in terms of omega-6 oils, we're talking about way too much of a good thing. Um, so yes, we need small amounts of omega-6 oils to help the mechanics of our cellular machinery work, but way too much of a good thing. These things are infused in processed foods everywhere. That's, how, that's caused an excess amount of omega-6 oils in our diets. In our flesh, these things become incorporated. It's caused an, a very gross imbalance in the ratio of omega-3s, which you know are good, and omega-6s, which we know are bad. So that ratio is off, and the overall amount of omega-6s is, is way too high. That is a primary trigger for inflammation in the body. And as many of you know, especially anybody who's, who's followed me at any length, uh, inflammation is at the root of most, if not all kind of chronic debilitating diseases, the big ones that, that lead to that 80% that premature death rate that we're talking about. So industrial seed oils, so oils that are often marketed as vegetable oils. You might think a plant-based advocate like me would say, yeah, plant-based oils are great. And in some cases they are. All of oil, excellent. Um, but oils that are derived from this processing, like from soybeans, from corn, from, from canola, uh, cotton seed, and safflower um, should be eliminated. And that is number three. So 
moving on, the next uh, bullet point that you saw um, for this discussion was the best sources of protein to build muscle mass, to get lean. Um, protein, interestingly, kind of enjoys this reputation in pop culture as this universally good thing. Um, I think all of you, certainly I, have seen things that say that carbs are good or carbs are bad, right? They've got this reputation and it goes back and forth depending on who you read and who you follow. Fats may be even more controversial. There's good fats and there's bad fats. And it seems pretty clear that we all can kind of agree that, yeah, there's good carbs and there's bad carbs. And there's good fats and there's bad fats. But when it comes to protein... It just seems like it's all good, you know? There's people putting it in smoothies and putting it in soups and putting it in supplements and, you know, eating more and more and more of it all the time. It's like protein gets a free pass. There's no good protein or bad protein. It's it's, it's sort of an interesting phenomenon. Maybe that time will come, and um, I'd like to discuss that a little bit. So we have a we have a problem that's a, a, a biochemistry problem, and it's a, it's a definitions problem. And, and the word that I want to use is quality protein. Um, in medical school, doctors, nutritionists, anybody who studies nutrition learns about quality proteins. And quality proteins are, are defined. There's a definition that comes that's all in all your biochemistry and nutrition texts, one of which I just finished editing right now, by the way. So I'm very familiar with this process. Um, there are nine essential amino acids. Essential means for our purposes, amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, that we cannot make ourselves. So there are nine of them that we can't make, and they are, if you want to take notes on this, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, and threonine. Those are the nine uh, essential amino acids. We can't make them, so we need to eat them. Uh, so the definition of quality protein is protein that contains all nine. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That's what we all learned. And to some extent, I suppose that's true, but there's a there's an issue. And the issue is that there's lots of places where you can get uh, all of those nine amino acids. For example, a farm-raised fish or a conventionally raised cattle, um, like a, a steak from a conventionally raised cattle or, or bacon even from a, from a huge hog farm in the, in the Midwest contains all nine amino acids. So by definition, those foods that I just mentioned would be considered quality protein. And since a bunch of plant foods contain some, but not always all of those amino acids, for example, nuts, seeds, beans, whole grains, contain in many cases seven or eight of the essential amino acids, but are missing one. Um, and some foods contain a different seven or eight, but are missing a different one. And so by the definitions and protein quality definitions in textbooks, a bean or a nut or a seed or a whole grain or a vegetable is never going to be a quality protein because it doesn't contain all nine. This, my friends, is a problem because I would much rather a person eat a combination of a bean and a grain than to eat that conventionally raised hog farm meat that we talked about earlier. In my definition, quality ought to be expanded beyond just a biochemical definition and into a quality definition that, that, that refers to the overall health of that protein source for the person who's eating it and for the world, the planet in, in, in general. And so by that definition, we and there, there, there is a movement afoot, by the way, that I'm a part of to help modernize the definition of protein quality because this is a real, a real problem. And a lot of people think that you can't get quality protein from plants, and that's simply not true. You don't need to consume all nine amino acids in your mouth at the same time. You can eat a spectrum of those amino acids throughout the course of a day or several days and still meet the definition of quality protein. So let's talk about the specific foods and the foods I'd like to have you include in your diet that meet my definition of, uh, of quality protein. Um, I would put uh, really good eggs, eggs from healthy chickens uh, that, are, that are raised in a regenerative, sustainable kind of environment. I think you know what I mean there. Um, on, high on the list. Egg albumin is a, a, a quality protein uh, no matter whose definition you use. Uh, I would also put wild-caught fish. Um, especially swimming fish, uh, less so shellfish, and there's there's reasons for that um, as another source of high quality protein. We have problems, and we're not going to get into it today about the, the the toxicity in the ocean and the problems that creates for fish. But um, high quality, wild caught, clean fish is a is a good source of quality protein as well. 
Um, I would also include beans, nuts, seeds, and whole grains on that list when they are eaten in combination in a single meal or over the course of a day. You can get all nine amino acids from plant-based sources. There is no fundamental need for humans to consume animal protein. Um, You can get all of the amino acids from plants, and I suggest that you get more of your protein um, from from plant sources as well. Um, So, And then, of course, uh, dairy products and meat products, like I mentioned before, from healthy animals, right, that are that are raised in a way that is healthy for the planet that they and we all live on, uh, also would count, of course, as high quality protein. So that's that's my uh, set of answers for you on the best uh, sources of protein to help build muscle, to help you get lean, and to um, help you know level out those macros in your diet. Um, I just I just turned uh, on the chat and I see that someone out there, Jake, is eating egg tacos right now. Right on, Jake. One of my favorite things. Um, egg uh, breakfast tacos. Gotta love it. Um, so the next category. Let's let, let's move on. I'm gonna wet my whistle with my tea here in a second. Um, is the worst plant foods to eat. These are things that you want to always avoid. Um, And maybe this sort of surprises some of you because yes, I'm an advocate of a plant-based diet. That means a diet that's centered on plants, but includes uh, animal foods and uh, other foods that are not necessarily plants um, in uh, in reasonable amounts from quality sources. So to suggest that there are bad plant foods, you know, what what might this be? Well, there's no question that in the medical literature, not all plant foods are created equal. You know, when you think of a plant-based diet, a lot of us, me, think about a whole foods, a minimally processed plant-based diet, um, foods from the earth, fruits, vegetables, uh, grains, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that's not what's out there now, though. Um, these days, we have processing plants, right, factories that can take plants from from the from the farms and fields and process them into these what we might call Franken foods that are absolutely awful for ourselves. So just because it came from a plant does not mean at all that it is healthy. I'll give you an example: Oreo cookies, which you know we all p- can probably agree are delicious, but also can all agree um, are not exactly good for your health. They're vegan. They're plant based. You know, there's no animal products in there, and that doesn't make them healthy. There's all kinds of vegan and vegetarian products out there that are highly processed food products, um, like the industrial seed oils that we that we talked about earlier, like uh, like like sugar itself. Yeah, that comes from a plant. So does high fructose corn syrup. Um, so do like like we just said the industrial seed oils, and so do all the highly processed products that are made from grains. Right. So your baked goods that are made with processed, milled, and bleached uh, flowers, sometimes even from GMO crops. Um, those foods are plant-derived, and you, one could eat those all day and say that they were on a plant-based diet, but but um, but that wouldn't be a healthy plant-based diet at all. So we are looking, in this case, the worst plant food ca- is, is really a category, and it's really ultra-processed plant foods. Those are the foods that I want you to avoid. If you do that, you will lose weight, you will decrease your risk of developing cancer. It's now been shown that for every 10% increase in ultra-processed foods that people eat, I'm talking about the things that you can buy maybe at a gas station mini-mart that are called food, you know, uh, snacks and treats and all that kind of stuff. Um, For every 10% increase in those level four processed foods people eat, their risk of cancer of of all types goes up by 12%. So that's horrifying, you know, that these processed foods quite clearly... Um, increase the risk of cancer, we should minimize or eliminate those foods from our diets. Uh, And so those are the plant foods that we should minimize. I'm going to share with you, I want to paint a picture here um, for for a minute just to help explain what this looks like in practice. Um, there's a there's a book and it's a coffee table book. I don't have it here in front of me, but I'm going to explain it. Uh, it's it's written by a guy and photographed by a guy named Peter Menzel, who I've, I've spoken with uh, a couple of times. A fascinating guy. He's a photographer. He traveled around the world and he took pictures of families with all of the food that they were going to eat for a week. Okay, so imagine this. It's a beautifully laid out coffee table book. We keep it at my office, um, and in that book are pictures of different families with a bounty of food that they're going to eat. Not, it's not always a bounty, by the way, depending on the family, but all the food that they're going to eat for a week. 
and you know you can go through this book and you can see that people in sub-saharan africa eat very very little you know and different interesting foods and food products but there's two families that i want to just paint this picture for you here now the first is the family from Guatemala. They appear to be a poor family, but they, they all look healthy. They have smiles on their faces, and they're standing in front of this table or behind this table of food. And on that table is this cornucopia, right? There's like, there's, there's, there's fruits and vegetables. There's leaves. There's seeds. There's nuts. There's some fish. There's, a, there's some chicken meat. There's a couple of jugs of water. There's some grains. There's all this stuff, and it all it's all very easy to tell where it came from. Now, it's not always so easy to know exactly what it is, like what kind of melon is that or what kind of squash is that? I, I didn't recognize all the foods, but I recognized that they came from the earth, right? Am I making sense? These foods all came from somewhere, like came from a tree or got dug up from the ground or got pulled out of a lake or river or, you know, um, or we're, or we're, you know, we're, we're running around the backyard, you know, an hour before in the form of a chicken. Um, you know, these were foods from the earth in a minimally processed way, right? So that's what the Guatemalan family was eating. It was just all that kind of stuff. Now, tran like let's let's like translate that or, or 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 compare that to the American family. So in the American family, they have this bounty of food, and on their table is just all boxes and cans and packages and foil wrap things and two liter things and pizza boxes and all this stuff right and in the middle of their of their their bounty of food is one of those little banana hangers you know it's like a you know a thing where you put your bananas on there and so the bananas are hanging there and it's the only thing in their diet for the week that came from the earth Right? It's the only thing. Everything else went through some kind of factory, went through some kind of plant, came from a fast food restaurant, was pop, pop, you know, put into a can or a jar or a box or a, a bottle. And it's kind of horrifying you know, that there's these Guatemalans down in Central America and lots of other places who are eating food straight from the earth. Right, and the Americans, and I hope this isn't you, is eating foods from packages, from processing plants, and we're we're in this category right now where we're talking about the worst plant foods to eat. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about ultra processed foods. Right, ultra processed foods have been well categorized, are clearly, clearly a major detriment to your health. This is the fundamental problem. It's not about necessarily fat, saturated fat, or you know, or or, or even sugar to that to to to. Well, if it's kept in reasonable levels. It's about ultra processed foods and all of the components that come together to form these foods. They're highly palatable, they are highly profitable, and they are highly poisonous. So that's what I want you to eliminate. Um, this is a perfect segue into the next uh, phase of our conversation here, which is about the exact diet that I prescribe to patients to reduce inflammation. And, you know, of course, by reducing inflammation, you're reducing your risk of chronic disease sort of across the board. And I think I sort of just described it, right? We're talking about a minimally processed, whole foods, as close to the earth as you can, plant-based type of diet. There's a there's a categorization system that's called NOVA that's used by nutrition researchers that 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 organizes foods in four categories. One is minimally processed. So even an egg is in that category. Um, but so is an eggplant, which is interesting. Like an egg and an eggplant are in the same food category. There's no other system where these are minimally processed foods. Um, and then uh, and category number four, you know, one is minimally processed or and then category four is highly processed. That's where your Oreos or your Twinkies or all that stuff in the packages would, uh, would, would, would fall. So I'm an advocate of a minimally processed, largely plant-centric, um, whole foods type of diet with protein sources that are coming from quality sources that are good for you, uh, good for the planet. So that's where I'm coming from on the exact diet. And we can get more specifics um, to reduce inflammation and reduce the risk of chronic disease. Um, so before we get to the questions, let me just check my time here. Yeah, we're doing good. We're um, we're a half an hour and 33 minutes in, and um, I'm about to get ready with your questions. So get your fingers ready, and I'll get my uh, live chat ready to, to help you answer them. Um, but before we do that, uh, one of the last bullet points, and I think it's a particularly important one just for right now, and I know this question is going to come up, is how to boost your immune system. Here we all are, um, you know, in varying shades of, of, of quarantine um, because of 
a global pandemic that seems to be showing no signs of slowing down right now. And it's 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 urgent um, and upon all of us to maximize our defense systems. I think um, very briefly, it's really important, and I think the coronavirus has made this clear, that any infection, including COVID-19, um, is an interaction. It's a relationship between an organism, in this case, uh, SARS-CoV-2, coronavirus, uh, and a host, in this case, you or me or anybody else uh, who's vulnerable. So an infection is a relationship. Um, and as you know, because you've been watching the news and hearing all these horrifying reports, um, there, there's no place where it's more clear uh, than in coronavirus that the, the vulnerability of the host, right, the sturdiness, the risk factors that the host has are a huge determining factor in the outcome of that relationship, right? So what I mean by that is there's risk factors, and we know that advanced age is a risk factor. We know that diabetes, heart disease, other types of metabolic problems, autoimmune diseases, increase the risk of having a severe outcome with COVID-19. This, of course, is not unique to COVID-19. This is most illnesses, infectious illnesses. You know, in a more vulnerable person, they're more vulnerable. They're more at risk. Um, and so the, you know, to the question, how to boost your immune system, right? Well, your immune system is part of is part of you, right? I, I like to say, and uh, I'm sure you all can relate to this. Um, in conventional medicine, you know, you might you, these days, especially, you might hear a doctor or a nurse talk about um, COVID in room 19, you know, or uh, cancer in room two, or multiple sclerosis in room three, ulcerative colitis in room four, right? And what I like to say is that I, in a 20-year medical career, have never seen a disease come walking into my office. I've never seen COVID. I've never seen cancer. I've never seen multiple sclerosis. What I have seen is people, people who have those diseases. They always happen, at least so far, in a person. Heart disease doesn't come walking in my office. Neither does diabetes, and neither does COVID. Those illnesses happen to humans. And they, depending on the overall health of that human, and that's there's some things that are out of your control, like your genetics and your age, um, but there's a lot of factors that are inside of your control. And so when we're talking about boosting your immunity and helping improve that shield, your defense system, you have to improve your general health. All of the things that we've talked to in the talked about in the last half hour are relevant here. They will improve your resistance uh, to infection, um, and you take advantage of the same dietary advice that reduces the risk of heart disease, of cancer, etc., and that will also optimize your immunity. There's certainly other things that one can do beyond diet, beyond lifestyle, you know, physical activity, really important. The right foods, really important. Sleep, critically important. Stress management, easier said than done, very important for optimizing the immunity. And then, of course, there are some vitamins and minerals that we can talk about. You can certainly pepper me with questions about those um, in the nutritional supplement realm for optimized immunity as well. So, um, deep breath. Um, for me, another cup of, um, of my tea, and then I'm going to get into the, the, the chat section. Um, I see we've got a lot of people here. Um, like I said before, my um, qualifiers, I'm going to do my best to answer all of your questions um, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so. So another cup of tea for me. Now's the time, everybody. Um, get your fingers going. Type into that chat. Um, I am going to do my best to answer your questions. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really let's do an ask me anything kind of thing. Um, let me know what you're struggling with. Let me know what kind of questions you have about herbs, nutrient supplements, and I'll do my best to answer them as we as we go down the line here. So type away and then I'll chime into the chat in one second. Okay, I am ready. My goodness, a lot of questions. I'm gonna start up at the top here. There was a question about collagen. This is a good question. Different types of collagen. Um, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 collagen. Um, yes, uh, there's actually many more types of, of collagen than that. There's about 16, if I'm not mistaken. The, the first four, 1, 2, 3, and 4, are the most common types of collagen uh, that are found in the body. Type 1, a major part of connective tissue. Type 2, a... a, a, a very important part, maybe the most important part um, of structural connective tissue like cartilage. Um, and uh, and so generally speaking, type 1 and type 2. Uh, and, and then type 3 is involved also in skin and bone marrow health, kind of um, interstitial 
So you'll usually see collagen products that come with various combinations of type 1, type 2, and type 3 collagen. For people who have really bad musculoskeletal problems, usually a combination uh, is what they use. Um, and there also is some data about tiny, tiny amounts of type 2 collagen helping people uh, with autoimmune diseases like joint diseases too. So um, not a super detailed answer or specific answer, but that's a little primer on, uh, on, on collagen. Um, someone Lee up top uh, neuropathy this this some um, question comes up a lot neuropathy and extremely dry flaky skin um, this is a question I think that a lot of people have um, quick disclaimer and the disclaimer is that we're not treating anybody's medical problems here I'm not treating anybody's medical problems here um, just giving you general advice from a naturopathic perspective kind of uh, uh, education um, and so these any recommendations I'm not even making recommendations but just giving you educational information should be run through your doctor um, before you uh, take any action because I like I said in the beginning am a doctor but I'm not your doctor so um, when we're talking about nerve problems, and it's a very common one, um, nerve problems respond well to, again, of course, all of the things that we mentioned above. We want to optimize the uh, essential fatty acid profile. Um, and when I hear something like nerve problems and extremely dry, dry skin, that reeks of an essential fatty acid imbalance that reeks of an imbalance between the ratio of omega-3s and omega-6 oils. So in that situation, it would probably make sense to make the kinds of dietary changes that are needed to reverse that oil, the oil ratio, um, by emphasizing more omega-3s and decreasing the omega-6s in the diet, like I mentioned above, um, and then maybe even considering the addition of supplemental omega-3 fatty acids in the form of fish oil uh, or other plant-based oils that are that are high in omega threes. Um, in addition, uh, nerves respond really well to to nutrient supplements, nutrients, uh, and herbal medicines that support the health of the mitochondria. Uh, there's a few that are worth considering when people have nerve related problems. Um, one of the top ones on the list is alpha lipoic acid. Lipoic acid, also acetyl L carnitine, is another one. Um, two top hits uh, for people with nerve pain. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I'm scrolling through all the hellos and everybody's here in Washington and Bakersfield, California, Allen, Texas. It's so awesome you all to have you all here um, and just to see you chiming in. Um, I got to get through a lot of the, the um, comments that people made about um, about the different things we uh, the questions that I was asking. Someone, uh, Christine, asked a good question, which is, isn't honey sugar? And the answer is absolutely yes. Let's talk about honey for a second. I'm a, I'm a beekeeper here. Um, I've written books about honey, cookbooks using honey. So it maybe is surprising that, uh, that I'm talking about demonizing fructose and high fructose corn syrup. Um, and I'm an advocate of honey. In fact, I raise bees in my own backyard. Um, yes, honey is a source of sugar for sure. Um, it's a natural source. It's a whole food. Um, and it is a gift from the bees. Remarkably, um, honey is amazingly useful and does not seem to provoke the kinds of blood sugar abnormalities that we see um, in with refined sugars like uh, like high fructose corn syrup and like sucrose table sugar itself. Honey um, actually has been studied, believe it or not, as the, as the sweetener for uh, for people who have diabetes, a blood sugar disease. And it turns out that that modest amounts of honey, reasonable amounts of honey, actually improve glucose control. Yes, it's a source of sugar, but it does not appear to be subject to all the kinds of problems that uh, that we see with refined sugars. And this is to my point, Christine and everybody else, honey is a whole food. It comes from the earth. The wisdom is in nature. And so that's if you take your cues from there and you kind of get back in sync into nature, into living and eating in a way that is congruent or in sync with the genetics uh, that are inside of our bodies, you'll be much, uh, much better off. And so honey is kind of a case in point, a classic uh, example of that. Um, so, um, oh, Melanie's chiming in about uh, people's puppies. I have one too. In fact, I can see her off in the distance here. Um, huge dog fan here, everyone. Um, so, chiming into the questions, I'm going to scroll down here. Um, Georgia asked um, whether or not sleep uh, enters into the immune conversation. The answer is an unequivocal yes. Sleep is very, very much involved um, in, uh, in in immunity. A deficiency of sleep uh, constitutes a deficiency of immunity. There's no question. Um, Michelle, you asked about probiotics uh, and autoimmune disease. Um, 
So, you know, whether a person with an autoimmune illness uh, needs probiotics, probiotics are fascinating. These are these microorganisms that inhabit the gastrointestinal tract, and they, they live inside of us. They live on us. These are the good bugs. Um, there's many things in the modern world, influences in the modern world, that compromise the health uh, uh, and the diversity and the balance of uh, microorganisms in our GI tract uh, and on our bodies. Mo most notably, antibiotics um, that are both taken uh, for infections, that are used in personal care products like soaps and hand sanitizers and things, um, and maybe even more frighteningly, uh, antibiotics are used in, in livestock. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but conventionally raised uh, cattle are given antibiotics for two reasons. One, it uh, helps prevent infections because they live in deplorable conditions. And two, and take note of this, antibiotics are used in livestock because it fattens them up. So this was a discovery made decades ago that if you give cows that are raised in uh, feedlots antibiotics, they get fatter faster and they grow more. So as a result, you can kill them quicker, you can slaughter them quicker, and you know your business uh, is more efficient in that in that kind of way. Antibiotics make livestock fatten up faster, so there's less days to slaughter. This is a big problem. This is a big problem because the meat in those cows contains uh, residues of those antibiotics and it's a leading, leading factor in the rise of superbugs. This is a long answer to your question, Michelle, about, about probiotics and autoimmunity, but let me tell you this. There's no question that the health, diversity, and balance of uh, microorganisms inside the GI tract are fundamental to the health of the immune system, including immune systems that are dysregulated. And, and by that, I mean autoimmune disease. Um, people who have autoimmunity uh, have um, derangements in their gastrointestinal microbiome. So yes, it's something to consider. Um, it's something to consider for sure. Um, so many questions. Um, bone broth. Um, Alice is asking a question about bone broth. Um, if bone broth is coming from a good source, um, then then bone broth can be good for you. Certainly nutrient rich, contains a lot of gastrointestinal healing uh, nutrients, minerals, vitamins, and whatnot. Um, uh, just very very cautious with uh, with with quality there. Um, Catherine's asking about a transcript, um, and yes, we will um, be glad to uh, to help you. Oh, Christine, you asked a great question. Christine Popowski, um, do drugs deplete your vitamins? I love this question. Um, the answer is yes, and we're not going to get into the specifics, but there's so many examples, right? So people take these pharmaceuticals for all sorts of different problems. And, and listen, I'm not anti-pharmaceuticals. They have their place. But one of the things to consider, especially if you're having side effects related to a pharmaceutical, is that drugs can deplete nutrients. So there's a bunch of examples of this. Probably the most most famous is um is statin drugs. Statin drugs uh, are are uh, cholesterol lowering medicines. Uh, the fancy term for them is HMG CoA reductase inhibitors. I know it's ridiculously nerdy, um, but HMG CoA reductase inhibitors, statins, deplete CoQ10. That's what they do. Um, they lower your cholesterol by inhibiting this enzyme in the liver. Uh, HMG CoA reductase, and thereby reduce LDL cholesterol and also reduce CoQ10. That's one very simple example of a drug that depletes a vital nutrient, CoQ10. Um, birth control pills, very common. Hormone replacement therapies, they deplete B vitamins and magnesium. Um, there are all sorts of antibiotics interfere with the metabolism of a bunch of nutrients. So yes, uh, there and there are many uh, different databases. I'm happy to share those with you that I use as a professional to look up whenever a person's on a pharmaceutical to see whether or not that pharmaceutical might have an interaction with a food or a nutrient. Um, this can go both ways too, right? So foods like grapefruit, for example, or herbal medicines like St. John's wort can often interfere with the action of a pharmaceutical. So um, so that's something that we need to be careful with. And 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 yet, and it's important, I, know, I saw a few other questions here in that vein, talking about um, different uh, products either that Up Wellness carries or that people are interested in taking themselves, turmeric, bromelain, or, or ingredients in one of our main uh, products called Golden Revive Plus. And there was a lot of people that asked me about interactions with drugs, um, including blood thinners. A lot of people are on blood thinners and blood thinners are kind of, they're dicey. You know, you got to get that right. You know, you don't want, you know, blood too thick, that's a problem. Blood too thin, that's also a problem. So there's a kind of a Goldilocks range there. And anytime that you're taking a medicine that 
influences where you are on that range. And that's what blood thinners do. They make the blood more thin. You know, you got to be careful, right? You got to be careful to kind of stay in, in, in the range, not too much, not too little. So many herbs, many um, uh, food-related compounds, including things that contain vitamin K, can influence where you are on that blood sugar, I mean, I'm sorry, that blood coagulation um, curve. And so you do need to be careful. It doesn't mean that you can't use turmeric or you can't use bromelain if you're taking any pharmaceutical. It just means that you need to be careful. You need to be supervised. And if it's a blood cl clotting coagulation issue, it needs to be monitored. Um, and so with good, healthy monitoring, uh, making sure that you're in the lane there, a lot of natural products can be used, but it needs to be done with oversight from a, from a doctor. Um, so um, let's see what else we have here. Lots of questions. Thank you all so much um, for, uh, for, for your questions. Apple cider vinegar. I saw a few questions come in on apple cider vinegar. Is it good for you? Yeah, it's absolutely good for you. Apple cider vinegar is a, a whole food, a classic fermented food loaded with probiotics, loaded with minerals. Um, it's absolutely something uh, that is good for you. There's been some studies in the medical literature about improving glycemic control, uh, that is blood sugar control. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, all of us here at Up Wellness are big fans of apple cider vinegar, both internally, you know, uh, it, 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 it's a, it's a great type of vinegar to use in your cooking, on your salads and your dressings. Um, and also topically, uh, ACV Secret is one of the creams that we use that uh, is, good for, is good for healthy, glowing skin. Um, so yes, a big fan of apple cider vinegar here. Um, Christine was asking about statins. I think I addressed the statins question. Um, and Jerry had a question about lemon balm and hypothyroidism and ashwagandha. Wow, that's a good, that's a detailed question. Um, lemon balm is a plant called Melissa officinalis, um, and it is, um, it's, it, uh, your question is about hypothyroidism. Lemon balm is widely used by herbalists for hyperthyroidism, so it's sort of the opposite um, in combination with a couple of other herbal medicines. I don't know that it's a direct contraindication. I don't think it's going to mess up the thyroid too much, but just like the question on blood thinners, it just needs to be monitored. A person has a thyroid problem and they're going to use any natural medicine, whether it's iodine or lemon balm or ashwagandha or tyrosine or any of these sorts of things that are commonly used to help um, optimize thyroid function. If you have a condition, it needs to be monitored. So, you know, yes, Talk to a naturopathic doctor um, in your area uh, and do your own research and then uh, talk to your physician who can monitor your situation. In the case of thyroid, you want to look at the TSH and the thyroid hormone levels. And if you're going to intervene with an herbal or nutritional cocktail to help uh, try to benefit that, pay attention to the way you feel, pay attention to the way your labs respond, um, and that's the best way to kind of keep you safe. Um, so let's see, what else do we have here? Um, I'm also going to check my time. It is 12.51. And we are cranking right along here. Um, Sharon asked a question about uh, eliminating inflammation and whether or not there's a program. I thank you for that question. Um, yeah, we we do have a program. I wrote um, I wrote a, a a book, a whole program that corresponds with a cookbook too. Uh, that's called the Twenty One Day Revival Program, and that that program is uh, is a is a program that you can certainly get. We will uh, make that available to anybody here. Um, we what we can do today and. Uh, there's a lot to a lot of moving parts and pieces to manage here, but all of you who are on here, um, I thank you so much for being here. And yes, if you want access to my program, I am happy to provide that to you. We'll give you substantial discounts that are going to be available uh, on our Up Wellness uh, shop. Um, any of you who want to go check out our new and very beautiful uh, website um, today uh, can go over to upwellness.com and we will um, do a 30% discount. I'm looking at my phone right now, so forgive me because I'm getting... Uh, comments from my team. So here, here's the news. Um, if you want to go to upwellness.com, anybody who's on this live stream right now, um, we're going to put a coupon code in um, in the store there where you can get 30% off, off anything in the store. And that coupon code is LIVE30, L-I-V-E, like we are right now, LIVE, L-I-V-E, 30. Um, go to upwellness.com and type that in. Um, I'm not sure whether or not the 21-day revival anti-inflammatory program is available right there right now. Um, but yes, I do have a program. Uh, it's called the 21-day revival, and it is a 21-day program, which is not a fad. It doesn't end after 21 days. It's a 21-day on-ramp um, 
to a, a anti-inflammatory diet, anti-inflammatory lifestyle. It contains a lot of the information, maybe in a packaged in a different form, um, and it cor- and it goes along with um, a cookbook and a whole bunch of material that, that that supports it, that makes that as easy as possible for you. So um, so that's great. Um, let's see what else do we have here um this is um a great question um i got a question from janet about oxalates i got a question another immune system so a couple more questions janet quick explanation oxalates you're probably being advised to avoid oxalates a lot of people are um by their doctors usually the reason for avoiding oxalates has to do with kidney stones because oxalates which are found in a lot of foods um can bind to calcium and form this thing called calcium oxalate. And that calcium oxalate is forms a very sharp, prickly crystal in the kidneys. And that's the majority of kidney stones are made out of calcium oxalate. So one of the ways to reduce the risk of kidney stones is to minimize the presence of oxalates in the diet. They're found in large amounts in dark green leafy vegetables. There's super high amounts in rhubarb. There's a lot in spinach. Um, Uh, kale, these kinds of things. So for people who are really at high risk for kidney stones, not for other people, but for kidney stone risk, um, minimizing oxalates is part, but not the only part, but part of a kidney stone prevention plan. So that's the short story on oxalates. And then I wanted to take, I'm not sure the first name, but um, uh, starts with N, about an immune system being too strong. So th- this is a great a great question to kind of finish off with. We're in, in it's such an important um, conversation right now about immunity. Um, and I think that, here's my answer. Y- your immune system is extremely complex, right? And so the idea that it can be too weak or too strong is kind of like simple, right? Like we, it, it kind of makes sense, right? You're gonna have too weak of an immune system, too strong of an immune system, and too weak means you get a lot of infections, and too strong might mean that it's attacking yourself, attacking your thyroid, attacking your, 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 your joints, and that's called autoimmune disease. The reality is, that's just not the way it works. It's much more complicated than that. So generally speaking, these people who get too many infections people who have autoimmune diseases or other kinds of chronic problems related to the immune system, they don't have an immune system that's too weak or too strong. They have an immune system that is unbalanced or dysregulated, right? Um, The immune system's not working properly. It's not that it's too weak or too strong necessarily. And so in those cases, whether it's vulnerability to infection or whether it's autoimmunity, the issue needs to be addressed in a comprehensive and kind of holistic way. Yes, there are things that we can do to optimize immunity. Vitamin D, very important. N-acetylcysteine, very important. There's a whole smattering of herbal medicines like ashwagandha and like andrographis, quercetin, that are very, very useful for providing the raw materials that an immune system can use. And, and maybe most importantly, all the stuff that we mentioned before, kind of re, you know, digging in to that kind of healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, stress management, optimize sleep, minimize toxic exposures, get back in sync into nature and in sync with other people. Those are the sorts of things that, that, that help an immune system. And then, you know, in, in, in a specific case, depending on the nature of the problem, depending on the risk factors and all the different components for any individual, we kind of optimize from there. That's how naturopathic medicine and works. So I hope that's um, an answer to your question about whether or not, you know, an immune system can be too strong. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's the answer there. So with that, everyone, it is 1256. Um, oh, Diane, I can't help myself. Frozen foods. Frozen foods are fine. Um, that this is a great way to end it. Um, we, um, we have uh, a question from Diane about frozen foods and whether or not they're healthy. Um, they are. They're fine. Yes, fresh foods are the best. Um, but there's a little kind of fun tip that I'll share with you about frozen foods um, and a little story. If you make cookies, maybe not cookies, maybe uh, muffins, blueberry muffins or something like that. If you made them with fresh blueberries, uh, or let's do, since we're not since we're kind of bad talk these baked goods, let's think about oatmeal for a second and frozen frozen berries. If you um if you made oatmeal with fresh blueberries. The oatmeal would stay oatmeal colored. The berries would stay intact. If you made oatmeal with frozen blueberries, the oatmeal will turn purple. Um, It's really kind of an interesting thing. And so what happened? Well, when the berries were frozen, the water inside the berry expanded. It broke the cell walls of the plant and all that good stuff inside those cells, um, which are called flavonoids and anthocyanins and all these amazing kind of antioxidant compounds, broke out of the cell and 
found their way into the oatmeal and painted it or stained it purple. Uh, this happens with most berries. So it, there's an argument to be made that frozen foods, especially berries, are actually arguably maybe more healthy because you have better access to the flavonoids that are inside of them. So that's my answer to the frozen food question. They are you know, certainly less expensive in most cases. They uh, do count as a slightly processed food, only minimally though, um, and they are much less expensive and make eating healthy fruits and vegetables much, much easier and affordable for a lot of people. So I am not at all opposed um, to uh, to frozen foods. I see that Catherine posted a link to Hungry Planet, um, What the World Eats. Awesome. That was the book that we talked about. Um, so I... Um, I'm going to hustle here, everybody. This was a treat. Um, we are learning the kinks, working out the kinks. I hope to, I got to as many questions as I can. We will archive the questions. I will do my best um, to answer them uh, in subsequent live chats. It's a pleasure um, to have you all here. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, take good care, everybody. Be well.